panel. So I'd like to welcome tonight's speaker, who is Dr. Chris McDonald. Chris is the Chief Executive of the Materials Processing Institute, which was formerly Teesside Technology Centre under Chorus British Steel, Tata, and became an independent organisation in 2014. So uh, Chris is going to talk to us tonight about digital technologies in steelmaking. So I'd like to hand over to Chris and uh, get, ask him to give tonight's presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, inviting me back to uh, to the SMEA to give a lecture. It's, um, I think, a couple of years uh, since I was last here, but it's it's always a real pleasure. Um, obviously a bit of a disappointment that we're not all together in Sheffield, um, but uh, but great uh, that we can gather together as a community in this way. Um, so if you'd give me a moment, um, I, I'd like to share my screen. So maybe Andrew, you might need to enable screen sharing for me um, so that I can share my slides. Can you do that for me, Andrew? That's been done now, Chris, you're a co-host. You should be able to share your screen. Right, I'll try that now. Marvellous, thanks very much. So I'm just going to pop some slides on the screen now, and um, it'd be helpful for me if uh, someone such as Andrew could shout out if they can see them, um, so that I know that we're, we're ready to start. Yes, we are, Chris. I just sorry I forgot to mention um, during the introduction. Uh, Chris will be keeping an eye on the Q&A section as we go along. But if you've got any questions you'd like to ask that are perhaps a bit more uh, long-winded, then if you could put them in the Q&A function uh, on Zoom and uh, I'll be keeping an eye on these. And then at the end, I'll uh, ask Chris maybe five or six questions on topics that seem to be quite popular amongst the attendees. Right, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so it's, you know, it is a real pleasure to be here um, uh, this morning, uh, this, uh, this evening rather. Um, talking about digital technologies in steel. And, and actually, I'm going to start quite broad uh, in the discussion um, uh, around the technologies and their application within the industry. Um, I'll then go on to talk about a couple of the technologies in a bit more detail, but uh, I don't want to dis disappoint anyone early on if you were um, hoping for some detailed explanation of artificial intelligence algorithms or similar. Um, I'm afraid you won't find that. I'm going to do a bit of a broad brush around some of the different technologies and how they could be applied. Um, but then I want to broaden it out um, at the end um, and just mention some of the uh, some of the wider implications about applying these technologies, not only in steel, um, but also more widely um, through through industry as well. Um, so maybe uh, first off, it might be helpful just to say um, a couple of things about myself. Um, so as, as Andrew said, I, I lead the, the Materials Processing Institute, um, which is a not for profit research institute carrying out research into, um, uh, into uh, new technologies in the steel and the metal sector. Um, and I've, I've led the Institute uh, since it was independent in, in 2014, but, but prior to that, I, I led the, um, the research laboratories um, up there in Teesside from about 2008 onwards. Um, and the Institute's got a, a really long history in developing uh, technologies for the steel sector. Um, it was set up, uh, or, or its predecessor, the British Iron and Steel Research Association, was set up in 1944, um, in the sort of uh, dying days of the Second World War, as it were, 10 days before D-Day, um, and had many facilities um, around the UK, not least in Sheffield. Uh, in fact, the Hoyle Street Laboratories in Sheffield were the predecessor of our facility. Um, but we're the, we're the last remaining part of that now. Um, and in fact, our remit covers far more than steel now. We, um, we, we cover materials, but quite specifically the metal sector in the UK as well. Um, and one thing that's been kind of interesting for me working in the steel sector uh, as I have for over 20 years is, you know, the first part, part of my career was very much about technology, research and innovation. But more recently, certainly over the last few years, um, a, a lot of it's been about uh, policy um, and, and about politics as well, actually, and how that then interacts with the technology. And, and I'll bring some of that um, insight into this discussion as well here. Um, as well as running the Institute, I chair the UK Metals Council, uh, which is the sector body that represents um, uh, uh, the metal sector to government. So it connects about 11,000 businesses in the, um, in the sector to government. And those businesses cover steel and aluminium, uh, but also supply chain businesses like uh, forging um, and uh, galvanizing, um, as well as foundries. Um, 
and, and I'm closely involved in various trade associations as well. So I, um, I, I chair the policy uh, group for innovation enterprise at the Federation of Small Businesses, and, and I, I sit on the board of UK Steel. So, um, so I'm quite sort of closely involved in a lot of that activity. Now we've had a quick look at the agenda there, um, but I wanted to come on to talk a bit about what the Institute does um, and particularly point out some of the facilities that are, that are relevant uh, for this aspect of digital technologies. Um, so at the Institute, we've got four areas of research that we cover. Um, advanced materials, which is primarily about the development of new alloys or the improving the efficiency of, of processing of metals. Uh, low carbon energy, which for, for us really is about industrial decarbonisation, about the use of hydrogen, for instance, in the steel sector um, or alternative fuels uh, in furnaces and burners. Uh, the circular economy, so a real focus there on recycling, on extraction of valuable materials and reusing them in the process. Um, and then finally, digital technologies, which will be the focus of the discussion today. Um, and for us, our interest in digital technologies is very much about how technologies that are being developed can be applied within the steel and metal sector. Um, and we're particularly interested in retrofit. So how you take new technologies that people are being developed and, and you know, bolt them onto plant and equipment that might be decades old, in fact. And, and you can see this in the, in the photograph here. Um, uh, this is our uh, facility in, in our laboratories, our pilot scale electric arc furnace. Um, and we're doing, we're doing some work there to, uh, to digitize that facility. Um, and I'll come on and, and talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, so we do the work that we do through, uh, you know, all sorts of experimental work in, in laboratories, um, through computer simulation, through getting out into factories. But one of our key pieces of equipment is our pilot plant facility, um, which melts steel at the seven ton batch size. Um, it includes an electric arc furnace, uh, secondary steel making, which it combines vacuum degassing and reheating. Um, and also a continuous casting machine and an ingot casting facility as well. And we've recently augmented this with uh, vacuum induction melting. Now, now for us, the, the, the main rationale for having this equipment is that it enables us to do um, offline tests and trials of um, new equipment, so it could be control systems or instrumentation type technology, uh, but also for the development of new alloys as well. So it's, a, it's a, at a scale that's sufficiently large um, that a semi-finished product, an ingot or a, um, uh, or a, or a continuously cast billet uh, or bloom um, could, uh, could be put into a, a downstream process. It could be sent for rolling or forging. Um, and so that enables us to, to carry out some uh, uh, sort of test trial uh, product development in that sense. Um, so it's an interesting place in that we've got teams of researchers and engineers, and we've also got a team of, uh, of operators as well, running something that uh, equates to a small manufacturing facility. OK, so I said I was going to start, start quite broad uh, and I want, to, I want to place digital technologies in the context of everything else that's happening in the steel industry. Um, and, and actually, you know, this year has been an incredibly challenging year, um, not only for the steel sector, obviously, but, you know, for the wider economy. I mean, so, so many people like me um, may have uh, contracted COVID themselves during the course of the year. Uh, many people you know, might have lost close family members or friends to the disease. Um, and it's really turned our economy um, and our society upside down in that period. Um, and during that period of time, I think we've seen a great response from the steel industry in general. Um, so the, you know, the, the Nightingale hospitals um, were put up at, at, at great speed in the UK um, and they use, you know, in, in the hospital beds and in the infrastructure there, steel that came from the, the Corby Steelworks and from, from the wider industry. Um, our transport network, you know, our rail network was kept moving by, by steel from British Steel and of course the steel that's applied into the energy sector has kept the lights on. And, and at a time, certainly back in the spring, when many sectors were closed to reduce the spread of the virus, um, our steel workers showed that it's possible to continue operations um, to keep themselves and to keep their families and visitors safe and so keeping the economy moving as well, generating some value um, in the economy. So there was a great response um, from the steel from the steel sector there. You know, the, the steel industry kept uh, kept that aspect of the economy running. Um, but for the steel industry, 2020 wasn't only the year of the pandemic; it was also uh, the year of, of settling Brexit as well and making adjustments on top of that um, to uh, tariffs, quotas, non-tariff barriers, and so on for supplies um, into their key markets, into the EU, and into Northern Ireland. 
Uh, now, dealing with any one of these two challenges in a single year would be a major thing for any industry. To deal with both in that in this year uh, for the steel sector um, was really quite remarkable. Um, but the, the truth of this really is that even though we spent the last year focusing on these two challenges, the big changes are still yet to come. The big things that we would have been talking about in the industry if we weren't talking about um, COVID or Brexit have not gone away. They're still there um, and they still need to be dealt with. Um, and so if we look at what those things are, um, first of all, there's the challenge of decarbonisation. Now, the UK has set a target to achieve net zero carbon by 2050. Um, and the steel industry, along with the other foundation industries, the other materials producers, glass, cement, um, chemicals and so on, is one of the hardest industries to decarbonise. We might need solutions like hydrogen or carbon capture and storage as an alternative to the blast furnace process. Um, but even for electric steel makers, um, for, the, for them to decarbonise, they need, they'll need 100% renewable electricity. They'll need to switch their uh, burners and furnaces to an alternative fuel. And, and also we wonder how will we capture CO2 emissions um, from electrodes as well. Now, my concern around this is that we probably don't have until 2050 to solve these problems from a societal perspective. I mean, I'm often fond of reminding um, people in the industry that yeah, the new uh, employees they want to recruit in 2030 are currently age 10 and the employees they want to recruit in 2040 haven't been born yet and you have to wonder what the attitude of those new employees will be to joining an industry if it's considered to be a polluting industry. The second challenge that the, the, the industry faces is around investment and um, so clearly the decarbonisation challenge comes with a need to invest um, but actually, some of that investment is at a scale that's beyond the remit of the industry. Um, so, for instance, for instance, if you look at this, this issue of hydrogen, uh, the steel industry could perhaps invest in hydrogen burners for furnaces or a hydrogen reducing process for iron ore. Uh, but then where will the hydrogen come from? How will it be generated at scale, transported, stored? These are questions of infrastructure, um, which will benefit multiple industrial sectors, perhaps also um, domestic users as well, and so are beyond the scale of the industry to solve. Um, also, on carbon capture and storage, similarly, carbon capture and storage could be a solution for the sector, um, but the billions of pounds of investment required for carbon capture and storage bring wider benefits in the same way rail and road and, and networks do as well. And so, again, it goes beyond what's required of the sector. And even if, you know, even if the sector did have sufficient funds, I think that there is, there is also an issue of timing as well. Um, so, you know, to decarbonise or achieve net zero by 2050 actually requires investment decisions to be made in about five years time. Um, so, you know, many of you will know in the steel sector, investment decisions are often made on a 20 year uh, horizon for some of the large pieces of plants and equipment. And some of those deadlines for investment are, are cropping up in the decade between 2025 and 2035. So we really need to know at that point um, what the alternative technologies will be. And the other thing around investment as well is that um, uh, it's rare, or, you know, it's, it's highly unusual in the sector, shall we say, for, um, for someone to make an investment that changes the whole process route at one time. So these 20 year investments are, are staggered throughout a plant. Um, and actually multiple of these things might need to happen at the same time. And that, that is a really big challenge um, for an industry that, uh, that often is short of cash as well. So, you know, it can be quite um, critical in terms of, of cash. Um, so for the industry to switch to, to low carbon, um, it is going to face this big challenge of investment, both for its own needs, and then also the wider investment that falls beyond the bounds of the industry itself. Now, the third challenge the industry is facing is the digital revolution. It's the application of digital technologies. And it's really important to think of all of these three things together, because actually um, the digitization aspect is to some extent a challenge in that it, it's, um, uh, it, it, you know, there are new skill sets, there's new equipment, new investment required that could lead to um, uh, changes in, in competitiveness or new product developments. But also it's potentially a solution to the two problems that have gone before. So if, um, if a company is investing to decarbonize, they can invest to digitize at the same time and also improve competitiveness. Um, and by digitizing, it's possible sometimes to reduce the scale of the investment that's required. And so you can save on 
on cash as well, but there are some risks around that and I'll, I'll come on to talk around those risks. So you see, if you want to think about digital technologies and the application of digital technologies, when it comes to the steel industry, we also need to think about um, how we integrate these three things together. And it's a big challenge for a player in the sector. Um, if they get this wrong and they fail to achieve a competitive advantage versus their competitors, then they could quite quickly go, um, quite quickly go out of business. Um, and just to sort of illustrate that point a bit, I wanted to um, uh, introduce you to uh, this uh, slide here, which is the slogan for a, a major player in the steel sector. And I, I don't know if you've, anyone's familiar with this company, um, but it's actually from Big River Steel in the US. Um, so one of the big um, steel players um, in America, really competitive and disruptive player in the industry. And you can see they say at their core we're a technology company we just happen to make steel and that's a real mindset shift um, in big river steel and in the steel sector so you know a few years ago they were an upstart entrant to the sector uh, they've now seen off major competition from established players and in fact in the closing months of 2020 us steel completed an acquisition of big river steel in order to backwards integrate the big river steel strategy into their own organization and you can see with big river how they've combined the decarbonization, uh, digitalization, and reduction in cost and increasing competitiveness from an investment point of view as well, all into one package that's been really transformational uh, for the industry. And the reason I really wanted to point this out is that the, um, this transformation that, I, that I'm talking about in terms of digital technologies, it's not, um, it's not me sort of casting my mind into the future and wondering what might happen, all I simply have to do is cast my eye across uh, the Atlantic and see what's already happened and then just wonder how many years will it take uh, to happen in the UK um, or in Europe more generally. There's a real competitive threat on the horizon there for, for players in the industry in the UK unless they respond to it. Okay, so that's a bit about, about me, about the Institute, about the sort of setting the scene. Um, so let's get stuck into the technology uh, and I'm going to do that by talking a bit about the fourth industrial revolution. So um, there are a few terms I'm going to use interchangeably um, when I talk. Um, so I, I will talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I'll talk about industry four and I'll talk about digital technologies. They're all common phrases that I used um, to describe the same concept. And, and, I, and when I'm using them, I'm not particularly making a huge differentiation. Uh, in, certainly in this talk, um, I'm using them all quite interchangeably, really. Um, so it's, I think it's good to place this fourth industrial revolution in this kind of broader context, because um, I, I think if I said the fourth industrial revolution, lots of people would be familiar with the first industrial revolution, but might wonder what number two and number three were. Um, so if we go back to the first industrial revolution, you know, founded in Britain um, on coal primarily and steam power, um, and it unleashed this swathe of, of invention. So if you, you know, if you look at periodicals at the time, uh, the number of patents, the number of new technologies that were unleashed at that time as a result of this, um, this new power uh, that had been generated um, is phenomenal, a great, um, a great explosion of innovation. And the, you know, the origin of the, of the fourth industrial revolution was really about transferring power um, from, from animal power to, to machine. Now, the second and the third industrial revolution saw the introduction of electrification and automation. Um, and, and, and you can think about this, I think, quite easily from the point of view of a, um, of a vehicle manufacturer and automotive producer. So you've got the Henry Ford um, production line um, and then you moved it, move into, you know, as you get into the 1960s and the white heat of technology revolution, uh, you move into automation, and then gradually um, also into robotics. So right now, we're in the throes of the fourth industrial revolution, and this is a huge explosion in the digital technologies that see an integration of what we call the cyber systems or digital computing type systems with the physical world. world. It's the bringing of together of those two things. Um, so just as the four, first industrial revolution replaced muscle with machine, so this fourth industrial revolution is trying to replace minds with machine learning. That's the sort of key comparator, I think, really. And there are new, cap new capacities there in digital technology um, and the ability to, to use big data to support artificial intelligence um, and then combine that with advances in robotics and with automation. I think what's important to recognize is we're in the middle of this industrial revolution right now. That's why I can speak to you 
um, through this lecture using this technology now. And if the pandemic had happened two years ago, that probably wouldn't be possible. Um, so we can see all around us the, um, uh, the you know, this, this really fast paced innovation that, that's happening now, just as it was happening in the first industrial revolution. And if you think again, if you think back to that first industrial revolution where we had, um, you know, Stevenson's rocket and the spinning jenny transforming Britain and transforming the world in terms of economic output, it also resulted in a lot of societal disruption and, um, and the smokestacks of Victorian England that resulted in environmental pollution as well. And, you know, we need to think about what the alternative consequences of the fourth industrial revolution might be to what societal disruption might come alongside that. And you can get a sense of that if you think about the change that's happening today as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with a company called Boston Dynamics. Um, and they've developed a, a, a robot that can perform basic human acts such as turning a door handle. Um, and it looks partly like a dog and partly like a, a snake. Um, and it looks quite intimidating as well. Um, well, for in a year, they went from that to a group of robots that hunt in packs uh, throughout a warehouse using computer vision to leap across boxes. Um, and if you think that it took 150 years to go from the world's first railway between Stockton and Darlington, in 1825 to putting a man on the moon in 1969 and that's the sort of span from the beginning of the industrial revolution to to the moon landing which used a computer that was you know no more powerful than in a, in a modern domestic appliance and um, to the pace of change we see now we can see that we're actually going through a, a, a technological change now that it's a far faster pace than we've ever seen before so I've put on this slide um, a chart that shows various, it's a couple of years out of date, but I mean, it's not, it's not too far off really, but it's a slide that shows a lot of the technologies that you might hear bandied around essentially um, and are under development. And I thought it would be interesting just to kind of talk through a couple of these um, and help people to understand kind of where they are in terms of development. Because I know when I hear a lot of people talking about the application of these digital technologies, um, you know, you get people can get very excited about stuff that's not really that close to market. And you, what I want to really know is, well, what, what's usable? What could I, what could I use now, essentially? So um, on the right hand side of this chart, we've got some technologies that are already um, kind of out there in the world um, that people might be uh, familiar with and interested in, such as speech recognition, uh, virtual reality and, and 3D printings highlighted there as well, actually. Um, over to the the left hand side of the chart um, are the sorts of things that, that um, uh, university research teams are very interested in. So you might have heard of quantum computing. That's a big thrust focus for the UK's industrial strategy. Um, and, and also quite a number of things there that are, that are related to kind of data processing and, and data analytics as well. Um, the bit that's kind of interesting, I think, is this bit in the middle that starts with Internet of Things at the top um, and then sort of comes down through wearable user interfaces, big data and so on. This is kind of the space that, that me and my team are really quite interested in um, because these are things that have gone beyond that um, sort of initial, as, it, as it's put here, peak of inflated expectations. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's kind of technology that's appeared and looking for an application. Um, and so to get it through this... Uh, so-called trough of disillusionment. We need to find some interesting and useful and economically beneficial um, applications to take these technologies forward. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that, that we're working on currently with clients um, in, at the Institute. Now, all of these technologies, so that was kind of a big list of technologies, essentially. Um, and all of these technologies come together in a concept that's known as the smart factory or factory 4.0. So you can see that 4.0. Um, again there. Um, and this is a kind of a dream of what a, a really advanced new factory in the fourth industrial revolution would look like. So it's making some widgets there and it's a fully integrated um, sort of cyber physical factory in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and, I, and I think this chart is, is kind of useful because it helps us to understand a bit about what these technologies are and how they could be applied. Um, now the heart of the factory is very much this bit in the middle that's shown in orange there um, and, and it's the sorts of things that I think you would first think about when you are when you're thinking about a factory and you're thinking about how you might apply these technologies so you know on the left hand side there we've got 3D printing and additive layer manufacturing in this factory which might be might be replacing some sort of metal forming or machining process 
Uh, we've got robotics, we've got autonomous vehicles. I mean, you've got autonomous vehicles in, in car factories now anyway, moving around the lines, delivering parts and so on. Um, and all of this linked together using sensors and then sending data up into the cloud. So that, that bit of it, I think people can kind of get their heads around. It's like advanced sensors, advanced automation, advanced data analysis. Um, but actually, where a lot of the real economic benefits could come for this factory are some of the bits around the side that, that maybe aren't the first things you think about. So to the right and to the left, we've got suppliers and we've got clients. And there is a, a benefit in using data that runs through the supply chain. Um, so if you think about, for instance, uh, materials tracking and being able to, um, to understand exactly what processing has happened to, a, to every bit of every material in a very easy way um, through a process, not, not in a way that requires um, huge complex systems. And then, but then not only to gather that data, but to use that data to create enhancements on the process itself as well. So that's where the artificial intelligence bit comes in actually. So that something like, for instance, defect reduction, it becomes almost an automatic process um, as, uh, as, as the process itself continues to learn. So that through supply chain element of it, I think is a really exciting part. Um, and then another part that's maybe a little bit neglected as well, that people perhaps don't think about so much is the aspect around cyber security. Um, and, and, you know, you can kind of understand why maybe people don't think of it originally because it's like, you know, it's perhaps not at the front of people's mind. Um, and also it is, it is sort of slightly uh, uh, ethereal perhaps. And yet, if you think about the risks facing a business, you know, classic business risk analysis, um, you know, all of this data that's crucial to how you operate your business, um, your clients and everything is all stored there. Your competitive advantage essentially is stored there within the cloud um, and available to be exploited by somebody else if they can get, a, get access to it. So industrial espionage in the era, era of the smart factory is very much about um, uh, trying to extract data from the cloud. And so, you know, it's really important that um, there is a very strong emphasis on cyber security um, in this world of, of industry four. Now this factory of the future, it shows us essentially a pathway for where we want to get to, um, how we can get from our existing operational footprint. We might already have a factory, and, and this is maybe where we want to get to. We have to think about a time scale about how we would get there. Um, but actually this, this transition is for me one of these big challenges around how we apply digital technologies. Um, and it's not something that's well understood, I think. So for instance, if we think about, you know, in Sheffield, we've got the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, and they're rightly proud of their purpose-built state-of-the-art facility for um, a smart factory. Uh, which they use for automotive aerospace, you know, etc., to really demonstrate these amazing technologies. But in the sector I work in, in the steel sector, but actually in the metal sector more broadly, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, capital investment is a major problem uh, in terms of financing. We've got these large um, uh, embedded capital already in plants. Uh, it's unlikely that people can replace the whole process route in one go. And so the challenge isn't really, you know, let's plan within five years' time to build a new factory. It's how can we retrofit this incredible new technology onto existing plants and equipment? How can we genuinely make a marriage between the, the cyber and the physical world, but it's the physical world that already exists with our legacy equipment and infrastructure? That's, that's the real challenge, this sort of challenge of, of upgrading and retrofit. Um, and that's why that's our area of focus at the Materials Processing Institute as well. And it's also why our pilot facilities are so important um, because, of course, our pilot facilities then can be a test bed for doing exactly that kind of activity. Right, OK, so that's a bit about the, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I am going to come on and talk about the technologies in a bit. Um, but first, I wanted to just slightly get under the skin of how we apply these technologies within the steel sector. Um, and to do that, um, I'm going to look at a, um, a survey that was recently carried out in the European steel industry to have a look at some of the perceptions and barriers around the application of industry for technology. Now, I mean, the first point is that, you know, essentially there is quite a high level of agreement within the sector that digital technologies are extremely important uh, for the future. So that's, you know, that's on the positive side. Um, but if, if we then go to say, well, look, why do people think that it's important? You know, what, it, what is it that, that, that they think they're gonna get out of this? There must be some perceived economic benefit and it's perhaps unsurprising that the, the first thing people tend to think of is improved process efficiency. Um, 
improving speed of work, for instance, reducing defects, improving reliability. Um, and, and if you think about that schematic of the factory of the future, you can see how that could work. Uh, but also steel producers have in their DNA, frankly, how to improve in efficiency. So they're used to working on really slim margins. So squeezing that last bit of efficiency out of a process is absolutely their thing. And, and you can see how they could do that. But I think what's perhaps more surprising is the second one that's on the list there is about the development of new business models. Um, and and that for that to come to mind, you know, you have to think, well, what, what is it that people are thinking about there? Um, and actually, we've seen in the economy at large, generally in the economy, the digital technologies have been completely transformation, transformational of traditional business models. So, you know, just this week in the news, we have the, uh, the breakup of Arcadia, um, a number of its brands going to ASOS, um, uh, others possibly also going to, um, uh, to Boohoo as well. And you can see there that the, you know, the, the war between online and bricks and mortar re retailers has been won now. Uh, the online retailers have, have won out of that. Um, and so what we need to do perhaps is speculate well, what would these new business models mean for the steel industry? What, what level of disruption could there be there? Um, could, it be, could it mean, for instance, um, a range of value-added services? Could it, be, could it mean um, more opportunity for, for e-commerce e or supply chain innovation that actually blurs the boundary between the supplier and the customer? Or, or as some people have speculated, a model of leasing rather than selling steel as part of a circular economy. Um, and if you start to combine some of these innovations with an increase in um, dynamic product tracking and data analysis and so on, you can see how you can create quite a different relationship between customer and supplier. And for the steel producer, that's very much about capturing more of the value in the supply chain as well. Um, so that's what the potential benefits could be. Let's have a look at some of the barriers that people in the industry perceive in terms of industry four. Um, so first of all, the technical barriers and right at the top of the list, unsurprisingly, reliability, safety, security. And again, this is part of the issue of retrofitting equipment to existing plant and equipment. We're not building a brand new steel plant. It's unlikely we're going to do that with existing facilities across the board. It might happen to some extent, but not across the board, certainly for incumbents in the sector. Um, and so they need to do that whilst keeping their facility running reliably and in a safe way. And that's where also then this issue of compatibility between old and new systems um, comes into. Um, so, so those are the top issues and you can really understand it again. And that's why, you know, from, a, from a, uh, an institute perspective, we, we see our pilot facilities as very important to this. Let's have a look though at the organisational barriers too. Um, because, you know, for, I know from personal experience, when it comes to introducing new technology, you can get the technology right. But if you don't get the people bit right, um, or the organisational bit right, then actually it's a complete waste of time because it doesn't really work anyway. Um, now, lack of qualified personnel features very highly on this list, uh, on this list of barriers. Um, and that might also be a contributory, a contributory factor when it comes to the uncertainty about economic benefit as well, uh, and also the attribution of costs and benefits to different units. Um, and, and I think one of the issues here is that quite often there is a choice of technologies um, that could be applied um, or it may be actually a concern with um, well where can we where could we see a benefit within within uh, within our process for this technology and if uh, if, a, if a business lacks qualified personnel if it lacks that kind of digital thinking capability within its business then making those um, decisions becomes difficult managers can struggle to make the investment decision you can end up with a, essentially a type of organizational paralysis around digital technologies um, and and, and, and a, a reluctance essentially to spend valuable capital resources, which could be, a, could be at risk. Um, and actually this also does tie up with the short payback time requirements as well. In some industries, it might be fine to take a bit of a punt on a technology. It might be okay to make high risk investments, but in the steel sector with um, cash being as constrained as it is, making the wrong investment could be fatal uh, for the company. And so it's really important that um, uh, the, the, the qualified personnel that are there, they're able to advise and the right decision um, can be made. So when we, when we, when I and my colleagues at the Institute are looking at the application of uh, digital technologies, we are looking at um, the effectiveness of many different systems uh, to help companies to have that knowledge then to be able to make the right investment for them too. Okay, so having considered some of those opportunities, 
um, and barriers. Um, there are four examples of digital technologies or industry four technologies that I'd like to, to just talk through. So an industrial internet of things, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and then finally some applications around the electric arc furnace as well. Um, so if we turn first to industrial internet of things, this, this is a phrase some people will be familiar with and some aren't, um, but essentially what it's describing is the connectivity of different machines or items of equipment um, to a, an internet server or cloud-based data collection system. Um, so for instance, with a, within a steel plant, we might want to collect all of the process and operational data, not only for the main processing equipment, but perhaps also for engineering services, for ancillary equipment, for movable plants such as cranes, and then collect all of that together into a central location where it can be interpreted and analysed. And then you get a really great degree of integration uh, between the data from all of the different pieces of equipment as well. Um, and another advantage is that by um, working like that, we can create this really valuable data bank for the future. Um, so if we want to develop new technologies or make new improvements in the future, then, uh, then we can do that. But also, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the smart factory, we can start looking at machine learning as well. Um, so the opportunity to apply artificial intelligence um, to enable the machines to learn um, and create really specific dashboards um, also for, um, uh, for different people as well. So you've got perhaps operators, engineers, and um, even people in the supply chain, clients perhaps as well, uh, you can create an, an operational dashboard for those as well, which is possible um, to share with them and then people get more meaningful information. The next step on from that essentially, so you sort of create your internet of things is the, then the application of artificial intelligence. So that's the interpretation um, and understanding. And this is the bit that I always think is a bit more of an attention grabber. Artificial intelligence is, you know, it's slightly more sci-fi. It's something people are a bit more interested in. Um, but actually, and you know, it comes to a surprise to those people who aren't involved in the sector. The steel industry has been um, interested and advanced in artificial intelligence for really a very long time. Some fantastic projects I'm aware of, for instance, that are happening in Tartar Steel in South Wales right now in this space. Um, and in fact, in my early career, some of the earliest projects I were involved in were um, artificial intelligence projects looking at emissions monitoring on electric arc furnaces, uh, closed loop controls of oxygen lances in the oxygen furnace and also slag free tapping as well, which we set up in a way, um, you know, many years ago actually is a sort of um, interactive game almost uh, with the operators. So this, the steel sector is, is, is also is really quite advanced in terms of these tools and techniques. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is the, are the big challenges that are in the sector. So, um, you know, we're dealing with processing at high temperatures, with variable input raw materials. You see this in the electric arc furnace as well. You know, you can get um, uh, different elements in the scrap, for instance, which, uh, which can really cause variations in the process. And when, when you're doing that, it makes a process very difficult to automate automatically. Um, and you have a lot of operator skill and operator judgment and experience that comes in. And that's the place where there's scope for artificial intelligence, uh, trying to replicate the thinking process of a very experienced operator. So helping to create some uh, generic kind of uh, control around the process, but also perhaps helping a company with um, its, its future skills planning and so on as well. And the next step over from that really is about how people can interact with the data, how you can not only display it, but interact with the data as well. And augmented reality um, is part of that. And that's where you want to try and combine um, data from the um, sort of cyber world with, with real physical um, equipment. And then, you know, a great way to try and deploy that on a steel plant is through integrated PPE. So people are already wearing their PPE anyway. They're already wearing hard hats. They're already wearing um, um, safety glasses. Um, and so, you know, how can we look at some of these opportunities for augmented reality and integrate them in a way that's just helpful and useful? Um, so again, when I think back, my experience uh, came through an engineering background, uh, you know, working on steel plants, um, to, be, to have the ability when you're going out and inspecting a piece of equipment um, to be immediately able to access its maintenance history, uh, its performance characteristics, um, you know, so maybe some sort of guides around um, uh, troubleshooting, problem solving, uh, this sort of thing as well. It, perhaps in, um, you know, through photos and videos as well as more traditional uh, processes and procedures as well. That all really helps to create a level of efficiency around an engineering team. Um, that wouldn't uh, wouldn't necessarily exist uh, if you couldn't use an augmented reality approach. 
Um, augmented reality can also be used for training as well. And again, I think that's particularly useful when you've got safety critical or um, kind of process integrity critical equipment. Um, so letting an operator loose uh, on, a, on an electric arc furnace or a blast furnace uh, is something that you would only do after a considerable amount of time uh, and training. But of course, you can accelerate that training through a, a virtual environment as well. Um, and so there is, a, there is an important skills element to this also. And then finally, if we have a look at some of the challenges that, that you know, I and my team have dealt with more recently, perhaps around the electric arc furnace and, and how we can apply some of these, these techniques to that. Um, so, for instance, on the, the traceability of components, um, perhaps we can use um, in, integrated industrial uh, Internet of Things um, in, in order to work our way through where, uh, where there was a particular source issue um, for perhaps some sort of element that came into the process. Um, or on, on energy usage, um, rather than because there are so many different variables for that. Um, and we try to, you know, it's one of the most closely controlled um, aspects of cost on the electric arc furnace, being able to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to that. Um, and then, and finally, what we all want to do uh, in the industry is to be able to see inside the furnace. You know, that's something we'd all really like to be able to do. Um, but increasingly, um, we have to close the furnace off to prevent any ingress um, of, uh, of air into the furnace for quality reasons. And so perhaps there is an opportunity for augmented or for virtual reality there as well. Um, so let's, you know, having had a look at some of those technologies, let's have a look at what, uh, what we're doing at the Institute. Um, uh, what we're doing at the Institute to deal with some of these technologies and how, we, um, uh, and, and how we're uh, taking them forward. Um, so our vision in terms of um, uh, Industry 4, as, as you can see there, is for the creation of an open access uh, demonstrator utilising our pilot facilities, our Normanton plant, as we call it, um, uh, that, I, that I described there. Um, and so just as essentially just as the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, as I mentioned in Sheffield, has got this factory of the future concept for manufacturing. Um, so we want to have this... Um, uh, sort of factory of the future concept, also uh, our future steel plant concept for the for the steel and more broadly for the metals industry to be able to test out um, some of these technologies. So the industry for technology, such as the um, cyber physical uh, production systems, using our electric arc furnace, our continuous caster and so on to be able to do that. Um, and we're also exploring alongside that methods for creating a digital twin of our steel plant as well to display the data and, and the methods um, of using it. Um, and it's certainly our view um, that by understanding the challenges of applying the Industry 4 technologies in this way on an offline basis, it will make the final application and implementation um, all that easier, really. So these are some a list here of some of the challenges that we're, we're trying to address. These are the research questions that we've set ourselves, essentially the research challenges that we're trying to deal with. Now, many of these relate to this issue of of safety, of integrity, of operating the digital systems that, that came out in that safety, the technical in that survey, I showed you the technical challenge of, of reliability and process uh, compatibility so that we can robustly test these new digital tools before they actually get um, on, the, on the factory floor. But you'll see there are a number of things uh, on that topic list as well that are related to the handling of data, data validation, data security, data connectivity as well, because you know, they, these are also aspects that could really disrupt a process um, if, uh, if the wrong uh, data was, uh, was being transmitted. Um, but, you know, the last bullet point on there is something that's, um, that's also incredibly important to the steel sector and its instrumentation. Um, so digital technologies are very much about the cyber world um, and about the manipulation of data. But the fourth industrial revolution is then how you bring that into the physical world. And an integral part of that is, for the steel industry, the unique challenge that we have around measurement. Um, so, you know, the, the, the processes that we operate are very hostile environments, um, and we need to be able to create ruggedized and re uh, reliable instrumentation. It's long been the stock in trade for us at the Institute to do that. Um, and it remains an important part of what we do in our collaboration with partners in the digital world in order to bring these technologies um, into the steel industry. Um, and one challenge that we've only just started to address is about data is about compatibility of data from different systems. Um, and you can imagine right now there are many suppliers out there um, offering uh, different solutions at different parts of the process. But actually, you don't get any real value from this until you can tie all of those together. 
And no steel producer wants to be tied to a single supplier um, for, for a, a long period of time or, or be trapped into supporting legacy technology. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is about challenging equipment suppliers to provide some standard interfaces um, between these technologies. And, partic and again, particularly as the technologies are, um, are so fast moving as well. So the kinds of things we're doing, um, we're first of all, looking at connectivity. Um, so taking different items of equipment in our pilot facilities and connecting them up to a cloud-based analytical system. That gives us a chance to, to test all of the connectivity out, but also the analytical system as well. And we've been able to identify some opportunities for these systems, potential glitches that, we can, that we've been able to iron out in our facility um, before they go online. Uh, the next phase in our development is the creation of a digital twin. And you can see here, uh, part of it, which is covering some of our plant service areas, uh, not, not actually the steel plant itself, but the, uh, the services and facilities. Um, and the advantage of a digital twin then is the ability to simulate offline process adaptations and also use it for engineering planning, logistics and training as well, as I mentioned before. Um, and then another aspect of the capability is around an immersive laboratory. And this is where we bring in the kind of immersive um, technologies that I mentioned before, so PPE, um, you know, immersive uh, technologies based around uh, providing information to uh, to operators or, or engineers as well, and, and how we can do that through uh, equipment that's also compatible with working in a steel plant environment, both for training um, uh, uh, as well as for uh, actually uh, people, you know, out there trying to do their work too. So those those are the areas that we're, we're, we're working in, and I thought it might be interesting to mention um, alongside this, that these, these, these aspects of digital technologies are a major part of a new uh, research program that we're now delivering for government called PRISM. Um, so this is a, a program of £22 million of research funding that we've been allocated by the government to support the steel and metal sector over the next five years. Um, and this funding is available for companies in the sector to undertake innovation projects with us um, at the Institute in the area of digital technologies, but also decarbonisation and the circular economy as well. So if there are any businesses um, out there who uh, operate in the steel and metal sector um, more broadly or in the supply chain or engineering businesses and similar um, who have been attracted maybe by some of the technologies that I've mentioned or want to do work in decarbonisation of the circular economy, we, we might well have some funding that we can bring to bear to support that. Um, okay, so that's, you know, a run through some of the digital technologies, but, you know, really what I wanted to come back to was, well, so what? You know, why, why, would, you, why would you bother with it? Um, and I think, you know, having seen that there is this big opportunity for the application of digital technologies in the industry, let's just think about, you know, what uh, those challenges around decarbonisation and investment that I mentioned, what, what, they, what difference they would make. And so I wanted to return to that, um, you know, that example, the case study I used at the start, which was Big River Steel. And this is Big River's uh, facility in Arkansas in the US. Um, and the site you can see there is about 1,100 acres, but actually you could fit one of these facilities on a site of 600 acres quite comfortably, possibly as, as few as 550. And that's a considerably smaller space than a traditional steelworks. Uh, but actually from this site or a site of this size, um, it's possible to make around 3 million tonnes of steel, actually 3 million tonnes of steel. So as much as either of the two big integrated works that we have in the UK at Scunthorpe and Port Talbot, um, and in fact, the steels that uh, Big River Steel make here are, are all of a, a, the same sort of product grade markets um, as Port Talbot, including electrical, electrical steels. Um, but what's even more remarkable than that is that they do this with a fraction of the workforce. Um, so I would describe this plant as hyperproductive. I mean, the factory of the future I showed you, there is an expectation that those factories will have a 30% increase in productivity by the middle of the 2020s. That would be good enough, frankly. Um, but this plant here, Big River Steel, is able to make the same amount of steel um, as either our integrated works in the UK to the same quality with one fifth of the workforce um, for the equivalent of a, a blast furnace integrated uh, facility. And that's not because we're doing anything wrong. Uh, this is like the first of its kind in the world. Uh, but again, this is, this is the competitive challenge really for a very advanced digitally enabled zero carbon uh, steel facility. Um, and so by, you know, applying digital technologies and new processing technologies at the same time, you get then your zero carbon, you get a reduction in capital cost, a reduction in working capital, a reduction in environmental emissions and a reduction in employment costs all at the same time. And I think the challenge for the traditional players in the sector is if they don't adapt quickly, 
then people like this will come along and, and eat up their business um, and be able to say at the same time, they're also reducing climate change um, as well. Um, but I also think that, look, that's the challenge. And clearly the players in the industry will have to respond to that or as has happened in the US, new entrants will come in um, uh, and they'll, they'll take the market. But I think we also need to think about, and this is where I really just want to, in the last couple of minutes, just broaden this back out again, is to say, well, we also need to think about what the wider implications are for society as well. So this is this isn't this is a technology opportunity, but it has big societal implications. So if you think about the consequences of a steel producer investing in this new technology and then making 80 percent of their current work workforce redundant because they're not needed anymore and multiply that up around the other sectors of the economy, you can see that the introduction of digital technologies has a lot of benefits, but potentially could lead to a major crisis in jobs and in employment. Um, and actually, this isn't dissimilar to the first industrial revolution, to other industrial revolutions, which led to a displacement in jobs and skills, while simultaneously creating and enabling new industries as well. But I think the challenge we face here is that this digital revolution is happening more quickly than any of those revolutions happened before. And also history tells us that overall, the first industrial revolution led to an increase in living standards and health and wealth, but actually for the first couple of generations living through it, it was a pretty unpleasant experience. Um, and it certainly didn't help those people um, initially. So, you know, you might have heard people talking about what's called a just transition, but certainly it's some sort of managed transition. And, and my, my approach here is that we need to look at this shift from, from workers to algorithms um, and ground it in a very, what it, for me is a very sincerely held belief of, of good work and the importance of work um, it, to create the sense of confidence and purpose for people. Um, so that as we commercialize the digital technologies, we're also looking at how people who are displaced with their hard wooden skills can be integrated back into um, other aspects of the economy as well. So my solution to this is that as well as investing in digital technologies, we, we also need to look alongside that at how we invest in skills, retraining and lifelong learning. Um, because we have to accept that a lot of the processes and business models that we've had in the past are simply not going to be competitive. Um, and, and that's important for the people who are displaced, but actually it's critically important for our economy as well, because we will, we will now need far more people who are um, able to move into, uh, into the digital space or into the kind of uh, new green industries as well. Uh, and so there is, there is going to be a demand there and there's going to be a displacement of the existing workforce. And we need to we need to bring those two things together um, to create those value added, added jobs as well. So that's that's kind of the point where I'd like to leave you really, which is that, um, you know, this isn't just a technology problem. It's a societal problem, too. Um, and it's good as people in the steel industry or technologists that we understand that we need to do this and that it's urgent. But I think we all have a responsibility more broadly uh, to think how we'll, we'll manage this as a society as well. Um, and so that's that's the point where I'll leave it. So thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much, Chris, for uh, that excellent presentation tonight. And we have uh, a few questions uh, being submitted by uh, people who are attending. Um, the first one perhaps doesn't quite relate to digital technologies itself, but does relate to some of the topics you raised at the start and challenges within the industry. And one of those is, uh, what your thoughts are on for the future of the blast furnace uh, in the UK or perhaps globally um, mm. and perhaps particularly with reference to the new coal mine that's been approved in the UK and the UK's target to stop all domestic coke and coal usage by 2035. Yeah okay so I have a, I have a view on that. Are my views any more valid than anyone else? Um, so, uh, so is there a future for the blast furnace asks Peter Morgan. Um, uh, so, Peter, um, there is going, there will, there will continue to be a need for more steel produced from ore. That's for certain. Um, so, from a UK perspective, uh, we're a very mature economy, and we do generate enough scrap to meet all of our steel needs. So, in theory, the UK could exist completely on scrap, but that's not true for most countries around the world, um, and it might not be desirable in the UK either. Um, so will we need to, we will first of all need uh, to generate more uh, steel from the iron ore process. Um, is there a future for the blast furnace? That, that's a slightly different matter. I mean, I, I don't really, 
I don't really see why there needs to be, frankly. So the, the blast furnace uh, can only really exist in the future if it's combined with some sort of carbon capture and storage facility, um, because there is no other way to completely eliminate all carbon emissions from the blast furnace. Um, and an alternative process would be some sort of um, direct production process, which could be using, um, again, gas and carbon capture and storage, or it could be using hydrogen. Um, and, and that seems, uh, or, or, you know, Bill Gates is investing in electrolysis, so he's investing in a company in the US that are, that are pursuing electrolysis. But actually the gas-based reduction process works, you know, uh, so you can imagine that being used. You know, the, the challenge is steel companies have got to invest 20, 25 year lifetime for a, a blast furnace. Are, are they going to do that? In Europe, it seems kind of unlikely to me. If they haven't already got access to carbon capture and storage, then I think they'll, they'll look to shift. Um, I don't think they can do it economically. Like, the gas-based process is always going to be more expensive. Um, so I'll, they probably can't do it on their own. They'll need to do it with, with government support. But governments in Sweden, Germany, Austria um, seem to have made it clear that they will offer that support. Um, and then the, the Cumbrian coal mine, um, well, I, I see it. I, Think there's going to be quite a significant decline in uh, in the use of cork and coal. Uh, I don't know precisely how their business model works. Um, perhaps they'll displace imports from the US. Um, so uh, if they do do that, then then they'll have a successful mine for a while to come, I suppose. Um, but overall, the market certainly in decline. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much of that coal we could use in the UK anyway, given um, given the usual issues around uh, sulphur quality levels for UK coals. Uh, there's a question there about why would steel firms not want to be connected to a single supplier for a long time? Um, oh, I think, sorry, I think that's related to, to my, my comment about um, switchability on um, digital technologies. Um, I guess there's two reasons for that. One is that it's, you can generally get a more competitive price from your supplier if you can actually, if you actually have the option to switch. Um, so there's no problem with being with supplier with a long time, so long as you can keep them sharp on their prices. Um, but, it, but, but if you tie yourself into a system that's incompatible with any other system and you've invested a lot in it, then you're kind of stuck with that. Your switching costs are high. So it's really just about keeping switching costs low to, give, um, to, to keep, uh, keep your supply competitive. And also, you know, that's not just about switching costs. It's also about whether your supplier can supply the best and uh, most appropriate technology for you. Okay. Um, well, I suppose one from me, Chris, I'm a bit intrigued by it. It talked about, about Big River Steel. Um, was the technologies that have been implemented into the plant driven by the people who wanted to build the plant or people who supplied the equipment for the plant? Yeah, so um, this, this sometimes comes down to the um, uh, level of thought, sort of thinking capacity within the steel producer. Um, so many steel producers rely on equipment suppliers to give them the latest information on, on equipment. And I, I think that, you know, if, if you have to do that because you have nowhere else to go to, then, then you, that, that is your choice. You know, what else can you do, really? Um, but you've got to remember that the equipment producers are there to sell you equipment. That is their job. Um, and I think particularly in this area of digital technologies, it's quite difficult to make a decision if you don't have some sort of honest broker or some element of thinking capacity. Now, the larger steel companies can hold that thinking capacity in-house in their business because they're quite big. Smaller ones can't do that, um, but then you know we exist, and it's part of our job to to hold that intelligence and to provide it on a on a on a very on a neutral basis. Um, so you know we, we don't push any particular technology, and, and if someone's interested in you know evaluating one, two, three technologies, we would help with that. Um, but I am aware that you know a lot of people do make the decision based on what their supplier tells them, um, and you know that's only going to get you so far, I think. Okay. I think we've gone through most of the questions that we've been asked, Chris. So I will hand over to Mark Tomlinson, uh, who's our secretary, and ask him to give a vote of thanks for tonight's presentation. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you to Chris. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so we're very fortunate at SMEA to, to know exactly what kind of quality we're going to get when uh, when Chris comes to speak to us. He's, uh, he's no stranger to us. Um, and I think we've been doubly fortunate tonight to hear such a, a forward-looking uh, discussion about uh, about the steel industry uh, and about the big things that, that are to come. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to hear uh, a little bit about how 
this industry can address those those problems in terms of decarbonisation, in terms of improving the circular economy, uh, and embracing data science and the associated skills issues that uh, that may arise from that. Uh, I, I think you're exactly right that um, not only do we need to understand the possibilities that uh, that are coming down the line. Um, but we need to have a, a good way of speaking the same language as the as the people that develop some of those solutions. Uh, and it's great to hear about the role of the MPI in that transformation uh, to provide a, a practical framework uh, based on real equipment and, and not just uh, a piece of science fiction that uh, that sounds better than uh, than than is deliverable. So uh, really great presentation. I was particularly uh, interested to hear about the, the the possibilities for integrating the supply chain within the industry as a whole. Uh, and it's great to see Chris uh, championing that approach when it comes to the hardware and software solutions that, uh, that are available and will become available. So I'd like to join everybody. Uh, a round of applause is a little bit difficult to <laughs> arrange on Zoom, but uh, thank you for, um, from all of us. Um, we, we do have a traditional gift for our, uh, for our lecture speakers. Uh, it is fortunately one thing that's, that's unlikely to be innovated away. Uh, we have a, a receptacle for your favourite beverage. Uh, although if you could do some work on the automatic refilling problem, that, uh, that, would, <laughs> that would be really good. Um, thank you again. Uh, and I'd like to remind members that we will uh, have our AGM afterwards on the Zoom link that uh, that should have come along with the original invite for this meeting. And uh, once again, thank you, Chris, and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone again at our next lecture. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.